Good evening, everyone. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, students, supporters, colleagues, and citizens of San Diego. It is an absolute pleasure to have you here with us tonight for the launch of Stronger Together, Women Waging Peace, our opportunity to have the Women Waging Peace Network at the Kroc Schools Institute for Peace and Justice. My name is Jennifer Freeman. I'm the Associate Director at the Institute. I joined the IPJ, as some of you know, um, back in 2008, having worked overseas in refugee camps in East Africa and with local peacebuilding organizations in West Africa and Northern Ireland. I came to the I I Croc IPJ because of the Women Peacemakers Program. It was an innovative program that flipped the traditional Western-centric peace-building programs I was familiar with on their heads. This program recognized the expertise that women peace-builders bring, their effective strategies and courageous leadership that I had seen evidence so many times during my years working in conflict-affected countries. And rather than telling them, we're here to train you, it said, we're here to learn from you and to partner with you. When I arrived, I also learned that recognizing women's leadership and its power to change societies is in the DNA of the Croc School. We've been pushing boundaries for women's inclusion and advancing the importance of women's peace leadership since our founding. As we all know, it was originally because of a visionary women philanthropist, Joan B. Croc, and her friendship with a pioneering university president, Alice Hayes, that the Institute for Peace and Justice and the Croc School are standing here today. The Institute's mission and the international reputation were forged by its founding women directors, Dr. Joyce New and Dr. D. Aker. And today, the energy and drive of our first woman dean, Dr. Patricia Marquez, continues to push the school into new frontiers of social innovation and impact. Ever since its founding, the Institute and the Croc School of Peace Studies have recognized that women's experiences, perspectives, and contributions to security and peace building must be at the forefront of international decision making alongside those of men. We've built the award-winning, globally renowned Women Peacemakers Program, which is entering its 15th year with a new reimagined design this year. We're pushing the frontiers of knowledge, bringing women who've made history into our classrooms. Women like Glenda Vilskett, who was a commissioner on South Africa's historic Truth and Reconciliation Commission. She's been here, and women like her, teaching our undergraduate and graduate students at USD what it means to advance inclusive peace and justice where the whole of society benefits. In addition to supporting global change makers, the Croc School is also advancing women's leadership here at home. The creation of Women for Social Impact gives women leaders from throughout San Diego a creative and collective space to explore ways to propel social impact in our region and around the world. You'll notice a thread in the initiatives I've just mentioned. We're not only advancing women's leadership for peace, but crucially, we are advancing the strength of collective leadership. From the polarizing discourses in Washington, DC, and at the UN, we witness the travesty of leaders who are unable or unwilling to work together to solve the world's most pressing challenges. These women provide a stark rebuke. Division and violence weaken us. We are stronger together. Tonight, we are honored to have with us a renowned pioneer who shared this vision. 20 years ago, Ambassador Swanee Hunt founded the Women Waging Peace Network, bringing together, at first, 110 peace builders and policymakers from around the world to fundamentally change the way decisions about war and peace were made. Since then, the network has grown to a preeminent group of over a thousand global experts on peace and security. As we'll see in a few minutes, women from this group 
have created initiatives towards peace that have changed the way that constitutions have been written, they've brought warring parties together to negotiate, and given courage to women leaders in similar circumstances all over the world. The network became a fundamental part of inclusive security, an organization that I've known for many years, I'm sure many of you have heard of or known as well, that's based in DC and consults with policymakers throughout the world on ways to involve women as decision makers in peace and security processes. Ambassador Hunt is the founder and chair of Inclusive Security and has personally traveled to more than 60 countries to some of the most volatile conflict zones where her team has worked and been actively involved since her time as a US ambassador and in the years since. Ambassador Hunt is joined tonight on stage by three members of the Women Waging Peace Network. Visaka Daramdasa is one of Sri Lanka's most revered peace activists. She founded and chairs the Association of War Affected Women, which she founded in response to her second son, a military officer, who went missing in action during Sri Lanka's civil war. Struggling to end the civil war, she was able to bring women together across conflict lines to work for peace. She has been a member of women, the Women Waging Peace Network since 2000, 17 years. Rosa Emilia Saramanca is a Colombian human rights defender and peace negotiator. She is the director of the Institute for Social and Economic Research in Action, an organization working for peace human rights, and democracy from a feminist perspective. As part of the women's movement in Colombia, Salamanca has worked intensively on the peace process between the Colombian government and the Revolutionary Armed Forces of Colombia, or FARC, contributing to what is known as one of the most inclusive peace agreements in the world. Ms. Salamanca has also been a network member since 2000, again, 17 years. Finally, the third peacemaker who will be joining us is Ms. Hamsatu Alamin, a familiar face returning to the IPJ, having been one of the 2016 Women Peacemaker Fellows, and who is also now a member of the Women Waging Peace Network as it moves to the Croc IPJ. Hamsatu is a trusted negotiator between militants and security forces in her native northeastern Nigeria. As the group popularly known as Boko Haram began to take a foothold in the north, she took it upon herself to engage with the families, with the boys themselves, and with the security forces, recognizing that increased militarism and the tactics of the security forces were driving recruitment, she said. Someone has to engage to stop this violence. She is also one of my personal heroes. Please join me in welcoming to stage these phenomenal women. What a joy to be here. We've looked forward to this very, very much. And it's been great being with my friends, uh, both here on stage and others, a few others of you who are part of this network, um, and members of the San Diego uh, community, members of the, uh, the school, faculty, etc. So it's a joy. Uh, people ask me how this network came to be, so let me take just a minute to say that. And uh, I know that you heard some of it in the introduction, but um, there was in, when I was in, uh, in Vienna, actually, as ambassador, and this is the part that most people don't know, I was hosting negotiations between two of the warring uh, parties of a three three way war, and it was really our Syria of the time. It was the genocide, and particularly Vienna was the last sane point before you dropped into hell, and so that's why the negotiations were happening in our embassy. And so there were fourteen days of negotiations, two rounds, and people were all set up, you know, in their separate rooms and in, in the embassy going back and forth and 
poring over maps spread out in my office about where the new the lines of the new states would be, and it was very concrete like that. And and then coming over to the residents, and I put them at separate, you know, I mean integrated tables, et cetera, et cetera. So I felt great when the negotiations were successful, came to the White House for the signing. And it was a similar kind of space. And the, the presidents came on, President Izabekovich and Tujman and, and uh, Clinton, and uh, that was President Bill Clinton, not Hillary Clinton. <laughs> but that's another story. We're not going to go there, right? <laughs> OK. Uh, so um, I'm, I'm, I'm here on the front row, right? And right before I sit down, I turn around and look at the other delegations from the negotiations. It is a sea of gray suits. Now, I'm thinking, really? And then I look, and there really weren't anything other than gray suits. Y'all, I, I have loved far too many men in my life. It's not that, you know, I, I can't love men. And I'm never talking about all men or all women in anything I say. But I was shocked that I had not seen that it was all men. And that's because, I mean, I thought a lot about this. I was looking through a lens called security. And I had to get this right in terms of the boring parties, et cetera. And I was not at all looking at it through a lens called gender, women, and how men uh, interact and the differences. Y'all, I had helped organize a women's foundation in Colorado before I became the ambassador. And I was known as this really you know, strong feminist, and I didn't see it. And so I thought, you know, the problem here isn't that we just have Neanderthals, say we have a few as, as ambassadors, <laughs> but, and they shall remain nameless. Um, so, but, but it was that, that I, I didn't even have the concept. And that's why when I was asked, to come to Harvard, by the way, by the dean who was Joseph Nye, and as you know, he coined the two words, soft power. That's why he wanted to have a women in public policy program. That's why he was so excited when we brought together the 110 women that you were hearing about. And you were there, yeah. right? And Yusaka, you were there the next year, right? Uh, it was because that peace agreement in the Balkans, just a couple of years earlier, it was so bad, it, was, it froze Bosnia where it was. There, there are now, by the way, three presidents of Bosnia all at the same time. There are three foreign ministers all at the same time, three prime ministers. I mean, good luck. Good luck, because they wanted to have one representing each one of the warring parties. It was terrible. And the women have said to me, I wrote a couple of books about this, the women have said, if we had been at that table, we would not have had that agreement. People would be back in their homes, the economy would be going, and they know how to do that. So that was my aha moment. I was converted, um, and, and bringing these other women, I, I sat back and I said, okay, what is going on? What is this magic? Sparks are flying. And in the best way and the worst way, too, um, in terms of what's happening in this room, all this energy, what is this about? And it was because the women said to me over and over, I'm the principal of the high school. The, the shooting started. I had to lean forward into that situation. But she never, she never went to the Croc School to, become, to learn how to be a peace builder. But that didn't exist. She was the principal of the high school. And so she, she felt like she was all alone. Like, because she didn't know anyone else from another conflict. But when they got together at Harvard, wow. Just getting together at a place like the Kroc Institute, it, there, you can't put a value on it. It is really important. And we had all kinds of connections to what was happening in Boston, just like you must have here in San Diego. You must. That's where you take an idea like this institute, and you really make it all that it could be. So we are going to hear now from 
three spectacular women. And you heard the introductions. I'm, I don't have to repeat that, but, but I do want you to give us, uh, each of you, more of a sense of, of what we're talking about. And you know, we use words like, oh, you know, um, has been a, uh, she's reached out into the communities and um, she has been able to talk with different sides of the conflict, blah, 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 which is all true, right? But that's not why we have you. We can read that, right? We, we want you to tell us what that actually looks like. And Visaka, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to turn to you first. Yes. <clears throat> when I came in 2000, it was like you heard, like my second son, who was a Sri Lankan military officer, was reported missing. He was 21 years. So when Achi, who was very close to me, was missing in action, and that's, I was a crying mother when I came to the first colloquium. I mean, I can still remember how, you know, gathering with all the other women, how much it gave me different energy, and also how much it empowered me to work for peace. It really made a big difference in my life to come and meet other women, meet the women from the Russian mothers of soldiers we met. So also to learn, not necessarily only meeting women, but to learn the skills skills of coalition building. I mean, many are things that women do at grassroots level. We learned it, you know, in an academic setting. So coming to Harvard, that was very special. Yeah, and what were the lessons that you learned from the Russian mothers of the soldiers? In fact, they were mobilizing them, just mobilizing mothers for peace. There's a signature campaign that they were doing, like, I mean, they were collecting signatures. And what I did was, when I went back, I replicated that. And I, we went to the religious place especially, because we thought that people are in a calm mindset when they are in, in religious places. We spoke to them to tell them that, look, we are mothers of missing soldiers. If you don't work for peace today, your sons, your grandchildren will be engaged in this war. So please sign this document and ask to stop the war. So that's what we did after coming there. That's really interesting. I hadn't thought about that, that you went to religious institutions because people would come sort of with a certain kind of openness or spirit. They'll have a little more time when they're there oh, also. That's interesting. Yeah, because otherwise they're busy, you know. Yeah, places. yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, it's, that's very strategic of you. What did you do with the signatures? We exactly, when the government, at that time, the go government have changed, and there was a talk about the Norwegians coming to facilitate, but there was no official invitation. So the 70,000 signatures we took to the Norwegian <coughs> embassy and told, please facilitate the peace process. So that's what we did. Yeah, the power of the, the mothers. And it's not, I think, you know, people, some people get upset and say, oh, you're thinking that, that to be uh, building peace, you have to be a mother and you have to say, oh, well, you know, I bring life into the world and therefore I want to. All of which I hear over and over. I've done hundreds of interviews, so I don't want to take away from that. But there is an extraordinary power when mothers get together. And I guess, oh, I know, I know. What of the, the Russian women? She's about, you know, four foot ten, like you. Yeah. And rem I rem eat, or are you four eight? I don't know, but anyway. <laughs> <laughs> and anyway, uh, Ida Kuklina, I, re I remember, uh, she was a heavy smoker and all. Mm -hmm. And so I said, Ida, how is Ida. it you, you, you go to these barracks, you know, and, mm -hmm. and to try to get, you know, to, to pull your sons out, you know, so they won't be cannon fodder for Chechnya. And, and I, how can you go up against these no-neck Russian generals? And she said, every general has a mother. <laughs> <laughs> That's what she told me. Yeah. Yeah, because I was asking, how, how can I tell the Sri Lankan military to wear the identification discs or the dog tags? Same thing she said that every general has a mother. So directly speak to them to their eyes, and they will listen to you. Yeah, that's great. Right? And, and then Rosa Amelia would come, and she would hear stories like this, and they would hear your stories about Colombia, 
What, what kind of stories would you have to tell? I met so many powerful women, so different. Um, Latin America is a place where conflict, these kind of conflicts were not so clear for everyone. So when we met all these women that were talking about all the conflicts disappearance yeah. and so on, so we heard this kind of, we began to realize that something was happening and then we tried to see our reality through the eyes of other women and we learned so much. Um, many, many stories really impact us. But um, one of the things I, I think that I learned was, I don't know, Latin American people, they call us political animals. We are always talking about politics in a very long way. With I, many we, words. we worked on the fact that it wasn't going to be a very long way tonight. <laughs> so, um, we had in this colloquium lots of exercises, and we have to speak in a very short way. And I was really so furious. And I, why? I don't want to speak short. I speak very long, and I like it. <laughs> why? I, I, I don't like it. But then, with the years, I learned that if you can have this kind of message clear and direct, and, and you, can, you can shape it in a way that is very understandable for others, that was a lesson incredible for the Press and Peace Agreement. Because for the women's movement, we have learned to be very practical, to speak very directly, and to try to move the ideas that we have. So I really appreciate these kind of lessons. It, I, it was very complicated. It still is complicated for me. But then when you see the outcomes of doing good messages and having few words for explaining what you want to go through, to get through, it's very useful. So that was something that really, I learned a lot about that, about how to talk to policymakers. That was yeah. incredible. Yeah, that, that's key. That's key in terms of the work that each one of, and, and that I'm doing too, is how do I take, how do you take your message that you have in your head and your heart and put it in a way that the person that you're sitting opposite can really take it in. And Hafsati, you have had to think so much about that and to actually do that and practice it. I, from what I hear, you are one of the great experts in the northeastern part of Nigeria in terms of how you cross over those lines. Well, as you rightly said, honestly, um, the Boko Haram insurgency has been internationally declared as one of the daredevil terrorist group in the world. So when they started, those who initially started this movement are all my sons, my two sons' age group. They attend college together. Every weekend they are in my house. I cook for them, chat with them. And then when they completed college, it was this set of boys and their cohort that started to preach that against the corruption, the injustices, and then um, uh, uh, that was, they said, perpetrated by products of Western education, that is their politicians. So they said, if this is what somebody who is educated in the Western sense of the world can perpetrate on us, we better go back to the original Sharia where peace and justice prevails. And then it became a very, very attractive movement and that formed the basis of their ideology giving the name that Boko Haram. Boko means Western education, Haram means it is forbidden. That's, that's fascinating. That so incredible. these, were, these yeah. were like young men, boys, who one day like were, or, in your home, and then, like, soon, then, they, they, then they, then yeah. they, then they became radicalized, right? Mm -hmm. And and yes. it was so against Western. So I education. could have been radicalized. My sons could have been radicalized. Yeah. 
And then subsequently, nobody seemed to be doing anything. Then it became an extremist ideology and subsequently violent extremism. So at that period, nobody, no international journalists, nobody goes there, no elder speaks. So therefore, the government responded by countering it militarily. And the military also, by nature, in fact, started committing atrocities against innocent civilians. Hence, in fact, that even boosted the enrollment base of the insurgents. Hence, many young men started joining them. They go and attack the military, and in turn, military comes back to set people's houses on fire. And it was at that period that as a woman who has benefited from the society, the society has given me much in terms of education, I feel that honestly someone has to intervene. Where no elder, no man, no government does anything, I said I, the ordinary woman, has to make my presence there. So whenever there is an incident, I will just carry my car and drive down to the scene of the accident. Uh, incidents, it was very dangerous. I was, it was, I see the boys striking their guns and others, but gradually they became used to me. So when I go, I go and sit in the burnt ashes with their parents, sympathizing with them, giving them whatever little resources, in fact. So they became used to me, and that's how I, I established my relations with them. So when they eventually moved out of my degree, and then a state of emergency was declared, in fact, nobody, in fact, two-thirds of our territory were all taken over by these terrorists. So it was at that period that I started again reaching out to these boys in their forest areas, communicating with them via telephones to allow access to international aid agencies to go and then deliver first aid services to the affected victims. At that time, honestly, even soldiers dare not go there but the International Community Red, uh, or Committee of Red Cross, through my intervention, were able to go back and come safely. They said, Mama, we will allow them go. Tell them to follow this particular road. Nobody will touch them. And through to their words, nobody touched them. So what this taught us is, honestly, no matter how bad and then dear devil a person is, he wants to be listened to. If the government has, at that period, called to listen to them, to listen to their grievances and try to address them, it, it wouldn't have escalated to the level that we found ourselves in. Rather, they countered it militarily, which became counterproductive, and then to date we are battling with the situation. This is really interesting. I mean, we were talking with a woman from Afghanistan, and they were talking about the Taliban. <clears throat> and woman, it was on News Hour, in fact, the, the television program we'd gotten her on, and she said, look, the Taliban says they won't sit at a table where women are. Yes, they will. Yes, they will. The first day, I'll sit down with them, and they will stare here, they won't look at me. The second day, they'll kind of, you know, out the side of their eye. The third day, we'll be talking, and she said, these are our boys. These are our boys. If my arm is hurting, I don't cut it off. Which is just like yes. what you're saying. In, yes, yes, I yeah. keep saying honestly, there is a saying in my, uh, by, uh, by my people which says, if part of your body becomes infected, will you cut it and throw it away? Of course not, but you seek remedy to it. So it, this is what informed, in fact, my decision to go out and then look for them in fact, that I was even nicknamed among them. They called me Mama, they called me Auntie. So even in the society called me Auntie Boko Haram, Mama Boko Haram. And yes, and they, I have never been threatened by these insurgents. Rather, it was the government agencies when I was making certain interventions to calling stakeholders, academicians, to come and sit down and discuss what is the way forward that in which this process I was arrested and taken to the military barrack with some of my colleagues. Nobody could go and bail us out, but then it became an, another opportunity all, all for us also to break another ground. So I engaged, in fact, being a woman, at least the men just 
delegated me to be talking on their behalf. So I negotiated with the military too. I was talking, they were talking. Then eventually they said, woman, if what you are really telling us is true, and then if we go through your paper and discover that what you said is true, then actually this is what your elders and politicians need to do. If they had done that, people like me would have no business being brought to manage a situation I don't even understand. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, so that, that became an a golden opportunity for me now also to venture into the other circle, the military, so that start, and then start engaging with them. I can just see you. I can just see you now as mama or auntie, and because there's such a, a, a warmth that you have, but also the, the fact that you talked about listening and how people need to be respected, period, mm -hmm. and, and listened to. I mean, yes. I, that's a real truth there. Yes, so that respect aspect also brings us to another issue entirely. You know, yeah, in the context, especially in the Muslim context, you know, women are relegated to the background, disregarded, not respected, looked down upon, not included, not consulted. But believe you me, if a woman knows what she is doing, in fact, even the Islamic scholars do respect, will respect you. That's why, in fact, when I started another intervention, as the war continues, I said, okay, what do we do now? We have to look into an avenue to counter the very narrative of this insurgency, at least if we cannot stop the violence, but we can stop young men from joining. That is counter-terrorism, countering the violent extremism. I, 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 um, it's very interesting what you are saying, because I think it's not only in Islamic societies. I think in almost all society, opinion of women are, well, not taken so much in account. Mm -hmm. I just want to say, when, we, when the peace agreement was beginning in Colombia, it was incredible because the first picture that was in the newspapers was a big picture, picture with six men, all very white and very political people, and they say the men for peace. And that was so incredible because women have been working for peace for such a long time in Colombia. And then appears this picture that says the men of peace. So women were really very angry because at the same level, they, they are not recognized or we are not recognized for our work. So we really get angry and, and we began to say we have to have women in the panels of negotiation because women will bring a point of view that will never come to men. So I think it's also in different societies, in different ways, how the opinion of women are excluded so hard. In fact, that brings us to the point of empowering women, really, equipping them with the prerequisite knowledge, both secular and religious, so that women, when we speak, we speak knowledge-based, and then so that the society respects us. That's in fact, there is no two ways to yeah. truth, uh, two way to truth. In fact, truth is one. So long as a woman is knowledgeable, in fact, every stakeholder in the society will listen to her and respect yeah. her. That is yeah. when I call the Islamic scholars now. I said, let's come together and then come up and then would encounter narrative, a narrative that will counter this Boko Haram from Boko Haram to Boko Halal. So therefore, I led this and then selected certain Western peace-building concepts like education, women's rights, living with non-Muslims, self-esteem, etc. And then asked the Islamic scholars to come up with a counter-armor what the Quran said about this concept. So the idea is generally to show the society that what people consider as Western which the uh, terrorists call, uh, uh, um, described as haram, is indeed in consonance with the Islamic principle. 
Yeah, so, and, and yes. you're trying to get in, Visaka. Yeah, no, I, I, this is precisely what the colloquium did, right? Back in, back in uh, 99 or 2000. And, 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 and throughout. Harvard, and, Harvard. Through, Harvard. and throughout. Kind of throughout. Yeah. Oh, throughout, yes. Throughout, right. because, I mean, we, uh, as grassroots level women who have been doing the work, I mean, when, once we came to the colloquium, we knew the theoretical terms for that. And that helped us yeah. also to speak in any forum, and we were also accepted because, I mean, we know very well that always people say it's at the grassroots level, we are called the peace builders, but to make peace, to be peacemakers, you have to know the language. So that's what was given to us, you know, the terms, how to speak. So that's, that's why it's extremely important, also like this kind of institutions, because it gives that elevation to the work that we do with grassroots. But, but no, I think also that we gave a lot of inputs for people in the academy or in the government to design another way of behavior towards peace. I mean, I think that women that are in this network have been working for many years, giving and taking in a conversation right. between policymakers between academy people and all of us into changing knowledge because I think that what the work we do we maybe sometimes we do it because we feel like that or because we think that is the correct thing to do but also this conversation has changed the ways of behavior of Many policymakers also. Sure, it has, and I've, I've seen that at the White House and Department of Defense and, and European Union. But Rosamil, can you take us back into Colombia? You all have had a, a yeah. Wow, it's been a roller coaster, hasn't it? Yeah. Working so hard toward that peace agreement, and then it comes and it fails, and then it comes back again. Can you? Can you take us into any part of that whole process? Like, where were you and the people around you, and what was it like? Well, first I have to say that in Colombia there is a very vibrant women's movement. That is important. And very diverse. Indigenous women, Afro-descendant women, local women, academy women. Um, and um, I think that it was so important in the agreements, all this join of women together and trying to give and having meetings in La Habana. Uh, I think it's so important to say that women went several times and I just want to describe one of the visits of the victims. Uh, women that have been punished disproportionately in a, in a very severe way. And, but people don't know that so much. So the victims went to La Habana, and, and you know, La Habana, La Habana is... Cuba, where the negotiations okay. were okay. being taken place. And this was a very, it was a big saloon. And then there was this table that it was like this, in, in this kind With of- A U shape. Yeah, mm -hmm. shape. And at this side, you have the Revolutionary Park uh, panel. And at this side, you have all the government and the, the heads of the negotiators. So the victims came. And it was a very serious and a very incredible moment. Because I think neither the government, neither the FARC knew how much women had been affected by the conflict. So they began to talk and to tell the stories about sexual violence, gen uh, gender affected by having all this kind of uh, cooking slavery and so on and so. And they were really shocked. And I think that hearing after that, <coughs> Las Farc had to think about asking for forgiveness to the victims in Colombia, and also the government. And I think that that's why in this agreement in this moment, people say 
that the victims are the center of these agreements. Wow. Well, yeah. well, and so many yeah, of these. Yeah, yes. Yeah, yes I'm please. talking about victims, in fact, finding myself working in the IDP camps, of course, we have over one million people who have been displaced. And then majority of them in those camps are all women and children. What, what is the number you said? How many? What, over one million. Over one, a million, one million. Yes. in these camps. Yes. Yeah. So therefore, in fact, and then we discovered that greater percentage of these women's husbands, in fact, disappeared, not killed by the terrorists, but by the, uh, after military uh, separated them from their wives and then taken away. So some of them, five, three years to date, nobody knew where they are. So therefore, looking at the trauma, the psychological disturbance, the loss of breadwinners and others these women are, then I started talking to them with a few other human rights defenders. We brought them together, organized them. Believe you me, the illiterate, poor, wretched women are now able to speak. We assisted them write a petition, we distributed it, we started talking. The government has to respond now to set up a commission of inquiry to investigate. So, in fact, we mobilized these women, about 500 of them. <coughs> when I stood there, I was the translator, translating their cases. Some of them openly testified that they were even sexually violated by the military, which means we have given them a voice, and that voice has been amplified. That government is now responding to it. Even if nothing comes out of that, at least these women have now been empowered to stand for themselves. Their self-esteem has been boosted that they can stand and then speak for themselves. So therefore, it's very, very important, honestly, in situations like this, where people are aggrieved, disturbed, traumatized, to engage with them and then, in fact, build their capacity so that they will be now the ones to take up their own issues rather than us, human rights defenders, or activists doing it for them. Very important. It's extremely important. When we were doing the consultations in 2016 yeah. for the reconciliation process. For the, with the reconciliation process? Is that yeah, in Sri yeah. Lanka, because Sri Lanka is in a period of reconciliation, because yeah. we are still in post-war situation. Yeah. So to come out from that to a post-conflict situation, we, we need to have the reconciliation process. So we did the consultations. For the first time, we had 11 member team with six women and five men. No, you the, didn't. We did. Really? We did. I was one of them. Whoa. <laughs> so here's proof. Really? We, we were really, that's, really that's happy. Amazing. Yeah. That's and then amazing. we did this uh, like island wide consultations and came up with a 700 page report. But, but what we found out was like going to the people, going to the families, going to the victims. Exactly you know more. And also there is a big difference of people when they are together or, or they are also coming together through an organization or an NGO. The, 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 the demands were much different from the families directly. Yeah, 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 that's, you know, that is so important because often we think, well, gee, we have to have women around the table because they're victims. And I think, no. well, wait a minute, how does that qualify no. No. you? But because what we need is very, very strong leaders, but often the strong leaders have been victims. Yes. And I think, yeah. I think it, they're coming out of the power of their understanding and their knowledge. But, you know, I, you know, I was in Colombia in uh, Medellin and meeting with the mothers of the candelabra, right? Yeah. And, and it was, it was really a lesson for me because there was so much pain, not just because of losing their children or the disappearances, the kidnapping, but also because there had not been an apology. There had yeah. not been a recognition. And I just think that, that society just stays in, in angst. Uh, until you get some of that, let's say it like it is, let's put it on the table. And, and women, uh, the word that I have found all over the world is pragmatic. 
That word is used over and over and over, describing one of the differences between women's styles and men's typical styles. Well, I think also women are resilient. I like that word because as used by Japanese people, you know, resilience comes from this pottery that has broken and then they reshape it and they put gold oh, in, all right. the, uh, in all the, the cracks, broken the cracks. You know? So you can see the pot after with gold and it's stronger. So that is a figure that we like very much because we think that many, many people, and especially women, broke, completely are broken. But they, I don't know, we have this kind of, we rebuild ourselves, and then all the lessons that we are learning make us stronger and make us, I don't know, another kind of, we, we have another kind of citizenship. Um, we, for example, understand that not always polarizing societies is good. For example, we can understand, we can cross bridges with the different ones. We can talk, as you were saying, everyone, even the one we think is the worst, has something to say. So I think that women have this ability to talk with the different and to try to have bridges and to find what is happening and then rebuild society. Um, so I, I really think that that figure of the, of the pot with these gold things is so beautiful to describe the resilience yeah. of women. Yeah, I'm going to write about that in my journal tonight. Um, yes. 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 But one more thing comes up, then I'm going to, I'm particularly aware of not just this audience, but how this, um, the tape of this conversation is going to be used. And I want to make sure that you all have a chance. It'll be used with students, and not just here. It'll be all over the world. And so I, I want to make sure you have a chance to, in a sense, speak to the students. And we know students in a place like this, maybe you know, 20, or they may be 30, or could be 40 years old, right? So these are people who are, are policy makers who've taken time off to do some special education or future policymakers. So will you all, in, the, in just the last few minutes that we have, would you say something to the students, uh, any words of wisdom, or just any message that you want them to hear? Uh, really, a lot to say, really. In fact, we must congratulate the students of IDJ for such a network, honestly, the headquarters of such a network to be situated in your own institution. Why? Because honestly, this is an opportunity for you to meet people, practitioners like us, who are locally grounded and also internationally connected. Because what we are speaking now are all based on practical experience of what we went through and then did in the field. So therefore, much as your lecturers take you through your theories and others, you have gotten now another opportunity boosted with your Women Peacemakers program. Now Women uh, Waging Peace is here with you, bringing internationally connected women locally, correct, uh, locally um, rooted in their communities to come and then share their experiences so that you can compare and then enrich the knowledge that you have. So that the students of IPJ, I'm sure, will come out better equipped than any other students in this world as far as peace building initiatives is concerned. I think I congratulate you. Well, you, you just made one dean very happy. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, for me, I think she has said all what has to be said. Yes, I think the students are very, very lucky to have this kind of a network 
to be louder here because I know since I have been from the beginning, the network is so rich. It's, it's not only from the grassroots what they have brought in, the skills that they have learned, not necessarily only on peace building, but also to live a full life, to live a full life balancing the family with your academic or your professional life. So I think that's extremely important, how you can balance the family with your professional life. So not necessarily only peace building, we also learn that. So this will be a very, very rich experience, and I'm so happy an institution like this is going to have Women Waging Peace Network. Initially, when Swani was telling that they want to think about it, I was feeling really bad. I was thinking, what's going to happen? Because this is something that we really, really liked and loved exactly. But having it here, so happy that it's here because it, for, for generations to come, it will be really be much more enriched. And that's why I thank you very much for really hosting it here because it can enrich and the whole know, world. Also, be second, and I agree with you exactly. I mean, I, I had to think, well, gee, why would we, you know, why, why would we move the network? But it is, it is a great thing to do because you think about the future and how you plant the ideas and, and what Joan Cross would have wanted here. Oh, she's smiling down on this. Uh, but I also want to say that in terms of the work at Harvard or in Washington, it, it's not like somehow we are now disconnected from the network. It's really that the larger network has this home, but, but we will be constantly having different ones of you with us at Harvard and, and in DC and really all over the world. I think it's a level uh, of, of having these kind of conversations and uh, ma management of knowledge. I, I think that we, we would like many students to go to our countries to see what, we, what is happening in our countries. What if you are, can come as interns and see in reality what is happening with the people. It's very nice to read a lot about us or to hear us, but it's so beautiful to meet the people in their countries. It's so incredible. People that are all the time building new answers to incredible, uh, incredible difficult questions. So I, I really like that the environment of Harvard is now also here and we have a bigger um, conversation and we really want to see you all over our countries talking with us, learning with us, and we learning with you. And, so and that's I, great. I want to add then to the students that you are looking on stage at three women, beautiful women, well-dressed, smiling, and coming up against Boko Haram, the Tamil Tigers, and the FARC, some of the most deadly groups in the world, but also, on the other side, security forces that have become, at times, as vicious as the, the people on the other side, and you're going up against them, and you become the bridge, and I, I, it is extraordinary. Joe Nye was right. Joe Nye was right. This is soft power. Hillary Clinton said, you know what? It's smart power. There's nothing soft about this. This is smart power, and we learn from you, but we also um, we honor you, and we are so, so grateful for you. Thank you all. Well, you heard me at the beginning of the night talk about how excited that we are here at the Croc School and at the Croc IPJ to be bringing this global network of women peace builders to the Institute, to the Croc School. So why am I so excited about this? Because I think everybody here knows that there is a reason why we need peace building that we're living in challenging times right now. We're hearing the rhetoric, 
We're hearing hate move from the fringes into the mainstream. I think a lot of us are feeling a certain degree of fear that maybe we haven't felt as quite close to home as it has been seeming lately. The devastation that's being wrought in places like Yemen and Syria and Myanmar and northern Nigeria and South Sudan and too many other places for me to mention are bringing also boatloads of people seeking refuge from violence, trying to survive by crossing borders and fleeing in unseaworthy dinghies. So desperate are they for safety. So we're sitting right now at a crossroads where we can recognize that these phenomena are all connected. And we can respond in one of two ways. We can be driven by fear, or we can be driven and choose hope. It is easy to, to succumb to the former when the solution is not clear to us. When these complex webs of cause and effect, violence and migration and inequality and more violence all seem to be getting tangled and growing closer and ever nearer. But I want to leave you tonight with my faith that we can choose the latter. We can choose hope because there is a way forward and we just witnessed it here tonight. Am I right? Thank you for being here. We are stronger together. <laughs>